Hi, I'm Julie from Shortlisted Productions. Today we have the pleasure of interviewing Will Wynn, who is the managing director and co-founder of Smart Pension. Well, thank you very much for your time today. You're most welcome. I've read that uh, your first business was uh, flower delivery service. Uh, how did you end up doing finance? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, my, my, my career path has been fairly unusual. I did five years in the city. I then did three years at eBay UK. Then I started an e-commerce flower delivery business, as you say, and now I'm selling workplace pensions. I guess the, the, the unifying thing around all of them is it's technology focused and uh, the ability to do self-service platforms at scale. So the flower delivery business has on over Valentine's Day and Mother's Day has like over a million interactions with our database because there's a vast number of orders and there's lots of courier tracking and all kinds of stuff. The workplace pension space um, has vast volumes of people needing to set pensions up. We're creating, we're adding an employee every minute at the moment to our platform. Um, and that's all about technology, scalable working. Um, and obviously the, the marketing side of it, whether you're selling um, workplace pensions or whether you're selling flowers, if you're doing it online, it's a similar skill set. So it may seem odd, but um, actually quite a lot of the stuff we do in the flower business is very helpful in the pension business. Can you tell us the story of your business? How did you come up with the, uh, the idea? We went live two years ago, but about three years ago, uh, I met a, f a friend of mine, Andrew. Um, I, met, I met him my first day in my proper job. And we remained friends for 20 years. He carried on 20 years in the city. I went off and did other things, went into e-commerce and so on. Um, and then I was meeting him for a beer, you know, three, three years ago, I guess. And he said, there's this thing called auto enrollment coming. He, at that stage, was in charge of Lloyds Bank's SME book, so over a million SME clients. He was saying, I can't sell this product. It's too, it's, there's, no, there's no margin in it for me. It doesn't work. And I said, you need to use the internet for this. As long as I didn't believe him to start with. He said, all employers have to set up a pension for their staff. And I said, I've never heard of this. I'm a company director. I think it's nonsense. Are you sure you're telling the truth? He's like, no, it really is true, and it's coming, and I can't make it work. So I said, well, if it's true, then we should get together. Um, and you bring the regulatory, the finance, and all that good stuff. I'll bring the technology and the online marketing. And that's how uh, we got together. We now have 70 staff. Um, we are setting up a new workplace pension one every seven minutes at the moment and adding an employee every minute. Uh, we are approaching 200,000 members on the platform um, and we're adding them at a, a vast rate, as I mentioned. We also have over 30,000 employers, um, and which, is, uh, which is a great number, and then we have 6,000 professional advisors on our advisor platform. It took about a year to build the platform, so we had to get um, the regulatory piece was hard, so we weren't even sure initially whether we could even enter the market because, you know, pensions is highly regulated, financial services are highly regulated, there's vast, large organisations, lots of FTSE 100 companies are in this space. So it was a little bit like, is this a crazy thing to do? So we've gone through various stages. We did the seed round where we just figured out whether we could actually build the company, that we've raised £160,000 for that and built the a prototype, built the platform, built some of the marketing assets and information, um, and get up, set up the regulatory structure. Um, as part of that was quite interesting. So we, for example, before us, uh, no one had, everyone, you would sign up to the pension by what's called a deed of adherence, which requires one signature and a witness. Now, I said we are absolutely, have, we have to do e-signatures. There's no way we can do the volume that's coming without doing uh, e-signatures. That wasn't possible, so I said to the lawyer, that's not the correct answer. Go away and find a way that this can be a contract, not a deed, because a deed cannot be legally e-signed, whereas a contract can be e-signed at that stage. They did that, and various other things. We had to figure out, can we make this work at vast volume without having vast cost? So we did the seed round where we just figured out whether we could do it. Then we did an angel round, uh, which was before we had a single customer. We raised money to go live. That worked really well. We got traction. Our message was working. Um, then we raised another round to um, accelerate and scale, uh, which went very well. Then we had a strategic investment from Legal in General, which is an amazing vote of confidence. Legal in General is the biggest pension provider in the UK. So the fact that they then invested with us was a phenomenal signal to the market. So that was awesome. Um, and they've been incredibly helpful. Uh, and we're actually now just about to close our Series B. So we have raised now to date about 10 million. This round, the Series B, will be between 8 and 15, um, so that's a wide range, I appreciate. Um, we, um, the 8 million is what we need to do the rest of our business plan in the UK and the core business as usual auto-enrollment. And then there's, there's money in the pot for consolidation of the market, there's money in the pot for cross-sell, um, and there's money in the pot for international. I'll talk through, so the business as usual is, is relatively obvious, carry on doing the same thing, there's still vast volumes of another 700,000 employers need to be enrolled within the next 12 months, which is a huge, huge number, um, and which we're looking forward to. Um, within the business as usual bucket, we're doing things like releasing a one-click integration with Sage, the biggest 
payroll provider in the UK, 56% market share, I think. <clears throat> so that's a huge deal for us. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the business as usual pot. Um, in addition to that, um, there is regulatory change. So the pension schemes bill was went through Parliament today, I think, uh, this morning, or possibly yesterday, uh, is one of the few things that's actually going to get through Parliament before the general election in what's called wash-up. It's also very interesting because the, as a consequence of the pension schemes bill, all p players within this market will have to get a license from the regulator. And there are maybe 90 master trusts, which is the vehicle that's used for auto enrolment or pensions in, that, in the trust space. The regulator will be handing out you know, uh, 10, 20 licenses. It's not clear right now, but that's a lot. That's a smaller number than the existing number of players. And so there's an opportunity for existing players to consolidate those guys who have to exit into their pot. So we have some budget, of quite significant budget set aside for that. We're the only provider in the UK, despite being only effectively two years old, who's done two of those acquisitions before. So we think we're in a pretty good position to do that. And we're very uh, interested in doing that. Um, there's also budget in the uh, fundraising for cross-sell. So if you are, obviously, a pension is a long-term saving plan, but obviously there are also things like ISAs and other shorter-term savings options. We think that if we have done a good job of providing you as an employee with your pension, there's a, no reason why you couldn't necessarily help. We couldn't help you with other savings. And then finally, the, the last piece is around international. So. We had a phone call um, last year, Andrew and myself, from a very large bank from a very well-developed uh, Western economy, and they said to us, uh, we've been researching auto enrollment and you guys are the world leaders. And we were like, are we? That's a surprise. Um, uh, we were not expecting that. It was a nice uh, thing to hear. And we've had a few people come to us with similar kind of messages saying, we are looking at it. We have the same problem as the UK had. We need to fix it. Can you help us? So we are developing slowly but surely. It's not an urgent process, but we think that we're probably the only company kind of in the world, really, who's looking at auto-enrollment as an international play. And so we're developing that softly, softly, and just figuring out how best to approach different countries and say, do you have this problem? We can help. Right now, we had a meeting two days ago. We went through the list of our top 10 possibilities, and we now have, now we're going to go into the top three. We're going to then do even more research, because we don't want to... Which countries are... When you, you well, know. I'm not sure I can tell you. I'll have to okay, kill you if okay. I told you. But um, <laughs> there's, there mostly, we'll probably start with a small one. You know, the, 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 what's the word? Best practice in international rollouts is always to don't, don't try and go and do America or China in the first one, otherwise, if you're, unless you're completely insane. So probably somewhere closer to home, possibly Ireland, would be an interesting area for us, because it's very close by, same language, very similar legal framework, similar approach. Lots of the people that we would deal with here will be over there. They, you know, there's lots of things that make it a, a sensible one. I mean, the thing is, you can't drive regulatory change, obviously. I can't go to Ireland or another country and say, please set this up. So, but, but, but on the other hand, you can say, if you have this problem, here's how it was done in the UK, and here's how we've approached it, and here's some of the things you need to think about, and here's some of the options you have. Um, uh, because we, that, that key government driving the business model forward is, is essential, effectively, for the, for the real magic of the auto enrollment business model to work. Pensions time bomb has been spoken about forever since I've been a kid, basically, i.e. there's aging demographic, and now there's a big deficit, and there's lots of national debt. This is not a good situation to be in. Um, so the government tried to fix the problem 20, 15 years ago with stakeholder pensions, which were an optional thing that employees could opt into, and about 10, 15 percent of the workforce did that, but that was not enough. And there's this graph that shows that gradually more and more of the population, or less and less of the population, is saving enough money for their retirement. So auto enrollment was, has been done in the antipodes, so Australia and New Zealand have done it before, before the internet, um, and it had been a success at reversing this trend of, of lack of saving for retirement. So Pensions Act 2008, that was the act that went through with the last uh, Labour government, um, was put in place to make auto enrollment happen. Um, then the coalition came in, and it was the first thing the coalition reviewed, so Lib Dems and Conservatives, because it's the biggest piece of legislation for the whole of the last parliament. They tweaked it a little bit, but they kept it going, and then it went live in 2012. So the, what, happens, what happens is, uh, on a staged uh, basis over five years, every single employer in the UK, be it a company, be it a charity, be it a partnership, anything, which is a private, non-state um, provider, has to set up a workplace pension for their staff, and they have to automatically enrol all of their staff into it, subject to them meeting certain criteria. So there's age, how much do you earn, and various other things. The employee can then opt out, uh, and the, currently the opt-out rate is about 10%, um, just under. Uh, but even if they opt out, three years later they're put back in again. So basically it's a, it's a way of using behavioral economics and nudge theory that you get put in there, 
It's actually quite generous. It's more generous at the start than it is at the end. And it's quite low to start with. And then the theory is that you, you go in, you think, oh, this is not a bad thing, and you forget about it, and then you all suddenly everyone has a pension. And it's working really well. The government's really, really happy about it. Um, it's regarding the, the guy who, the pensions minister got knighted, uh, so Steve Webb now. Um, the uh, guy, the chap at the pension regulator who's in charge of auto enrollment, Charles Council, got an OBE. So clearly the government is, um, is happy with how it's, how it's going. Um, it makes sense. It's a logical thing to do. The reason it's generous is, for, to begin with, it's 2% of your salary. And with the employee, for every one pound of net pay they put in, um, they get one pound fifty put in on top. They get a little bit of tax credit to top up, and they get one pound from their employer. So there's not many places you can put one pound of your save your your money, your salary into a pot, and it immediately becomes one pound fifty or two pounds fifty. So yeah, that's the legislative background. We have uh, two outsourced relationships. We have uh, Apex Funds Administration who do the administration, and then we have Legal and General who have the underlying funds. Um, when we started out, again, as I was saying before, we, we sort of said, how do, what do we need? What are the component pieces we need to put this machine together? And one of them was administration. So we went round all the main pension administrators and said, can you do digital transactions? Can you do volume? Can you do scale? And they were like, no, we can do letters and envelopes and this sort of thing. We're like, this is not good. And it was like, this is not, this is not we're not doing this. This is crazy. Um, some people perhaps also said to us, who the hell are you? We're not going to talk to you um, at all, but um, that's not, that, that didn't stop us. Apex were, were a really good choice for us. So they, um, they do, they, I think they're the world's largest independent funds administrator with about 30 billion of assets under administration. They do thousands of transactions every day. So they, they do hedge funds and various other types of not, they weren't in the pension space, but they do lots and lots of volume and that's what they're good at. And so therefore, and they can do digital business. That was how we um, became partners with them. Um, and then legal in general, we were using them already on a sort of third uh, arm's length basis. So we didn't know any of the key people. We were getting traction, we were getting volume, and that was interesting. So then we got an introduction to some relatively senior people there. We felt that there was an opportunity for them to point their smaller business towards us, and then the money ends up in their funds anyway. Um, and then, and then for, for strategic relationship to develop. And so that's been a fantastic relationship. And obviously, we've got excellent pricing, I would say. And so everyone, everyone wins. They've got access to a segment of the market that they are not able to easily service. Um, and then we have great pricing and we have their support and their vote of confidence, which is the two things that made the biggest difference to our business model last year. One was when we went on the pension regulated website as an approved master trust assurance framework approved um, provider. It's not a very sexy term, but it's a very important thing. We're on the regulated website, so we are legit. Uh, the second thing was legal and general investing and doing this partnership with a commercial partnership with us. That's a massive, massive vote of confidence. You have two types of clients. Uh, so the small businesses can come directly to mm -hmm. you and also you're offering that as a uh, platform tool for accountants mm -hmm. or uh, independent financial advisors. Yes. Uh, so, so can you expand on that? Our view was that the advisor intermediary channel would not be a big deal for us because surely everyone who was in the market already would have sewn that market up. So we built a direct platform for SMEs to come to us and do their one company. Um, but then we started getting people knocking on the door saying, I'd like to use your platform for these various different reasons, the pricing, because it's a quick and efficient, all the good reasons. And when it became more of a torrent, we said, okay, well, fine, we'll, we'll, we'll build a platform for advisors and intermediaries. So it's, it's accountants, bookkeepers, IFAs, and also payroll bureaus is another intermediary. So some people say, I don't care which one it is, as long as it works my payroll bureau. So, but yes, we, that advisor channel now is delivering about 35% of our signups. So effectively a 50% uplift from on the direct model. Um, we expect it to end up about 50-50. So the good thing about the advisor channel, obviously, is you acquire an advisor for X cost, and then they give you a client now, and then another client, and another client. So this, this, the, the CPA, the cost per acquisition, is actually lower. It costs us more to get an advisor, but they will typically give us between 10 and 20 clients. Whereas a company, you sign them up, they might tell their friends, but they're not really going to give you many more than one or 1 1.2 signups. We don't disclose assets under management uh, currently, so I won't, uh, so I won't, I can't share that one with you. Um, but and we are on track to get to our business plan, so that would have us having probably 600,000 members middle of next year. So it's quite a big uplift from where we are at the moment, because we're just under 200,000. Quite a lot of our companies are future staging, they haven't loaded their staff yet. We'll probably generate between 800 million and 1.2 billion of AUM a year once it reaches maturity. So the one thing I didn't mention earlier on regarding the regulatory uh, setup is it starts at 2% of your salary, and about a year from now it goes to 
5% and then it goes to 8% a year so in 2019. What is the average contribution per employee at the moment? Uh, it's low uh, because uh, the, the UK average salary is £27,000 um, currently, um, but the average salary of, of a member within our scheme is about £22,000 currently. Um, and the first £6,000 of contribution of your salary does not you don't make contributions on it, or you're not required to make contributions on it under the rules. Um, but the average person is putting in about £400 currently, um, so that's at 2%, so obviously if it goes up to 8%, that's going to be £1,600. It's, it's a difficult business to raise money for because there's a three, there's a, a long period where we make no money, we're not charging the employer to set up with us, we, it's free to you, so we get, we're maximising as many people as we possibly can onto the platform in this period, and then a few years later, that's when we start to make money. So you have to believe that spending all this money here will yield the money over here, which is some people just can't get their head around that. They're like, uh, why would I burn all this cash to then make a whole lot more cash later? It's confusing, but, but we're on target and therefore it makes sense. We only charge 75 basis points on your average AUM in the year, effectively. We don't do monthly transaction charges, which some of our competitors do, which we think is pretty outrageous because it bumps the cost up hugely. We don't charge the employer. Um, uh, so we, and we're not profitable now, no, and we never expect to be profitable now because the pots are small, the contribution the percentage is small, um, and, so there's, and, the, and, the, and we haven't got everyone on board yet. Um, so we will become profitable in 2019 when the contributions go from, well, they go from 2% this year to 5% next year, 8% the year after. When it goes to 8%, we'll become profitable pretty much instantly. Can you tell us more about uh, what you're offering your end clients? Sure, so um, we have four lifestyle funds. So they're, they're designed by uh, one of our um, trustees and then they then get reviewed by uh, an independent FCA regulated um, company called Barnett Waddingham. So they make sure this is fit for purpose. That gets signed off uh, by, the, by Barnett Waddingham and therefore by the trustees. And that's effectively the set of rules for how money is invested. And there are four lifestyle pots and you get put into one automatically depending on your age. Um, so initially it's a growth fund and then it starts to become more conservative over time as you get towards retirement. Um, we also have a Sharia fund, um, which is, uh, allows it, it's just, if you're a Muslim, then that means you can invest without any problems around borrowing and lending and that stuff. Um, and so yeah, so the funds are designed to grow uh, with as little risk as possible whilst not being so conservative that you know you get 1% return on your money. I'm happy to report that uh, last year is our first full year and um, our main fund returned 19%, which is pretty good growth, um, with significantly less volatility uh, than the FTSE 100, so um, that was uh, a good result. Uh, do you benchmark uh, the performance of your funds uh, to other pension funds? So I haven't got the numbers in my head, but I know that we outperformed, I think, almost everyone in our sector. I don't want to like o overdo it because you know things can go up and things can go down. So I don't want to like have an egg in my face if it doesn't go well. But it's not particularly my area. But I know that we've um, we're very pleased with it, and it's been met with really good reception in the advisor community in particular. We currently have quite a vanilla um, setup. We are going to develop a few additional options for our core audience around, so actually here's something a bit more interesting. And then in due course, and there's lots of possibilities. So we, we have access to the uh, Legal and General um, uh, Legal and General's platform, and that has 120 funds on it. Not all of them are Legal and General, there's some other ones. Um, and so we are thinking at the moment about what we want to do around some more interesting products. We can also look to do some non auto enrollment things potentially in due course, uh, be it around pensions or be it around ISAs or other savings products and other things. And that's a process that we're going through at the moment, thinking about what we might offer. Um, I think the key overriding piece is that we don't want to just do everything and you know just throw everything at the, at the wall and hope that something sticks. Um, we want to do stuff which is interesting and novel and adds value. Uh, so maybe we could talk about generally your competitors and where, where you mm -hmm. stand and how you're different from them. So we, the, the, our competitors break out into um, the government, effectively, it's a, quite, it's a non departmental government organisation, but it's basically the government at, at arm's length. Um, some people who are set up directly for auto enrolment, the sort of the people you'd expect, so the big financial services organisations, and then potentially uh, new entrants like us. So the government was set up as a, as a lender of last resort equivalent, so you can't say to people you will go to prison if you don't do this, and then there's no one in the private sector to supply them. As it happens, the private sector has supplied, so maybe Nest one day will disappear because Nest is not strictly required. Uh, it's not a particularly sophisticated product, it's actually very expensive for employees, um, but it's the government, so they have that, and they, they're taking probably 60, 65% market share. Then you have people who are set up for the market, so there's a, people's pension are pretty good, 
um, and they were, um, but they're charging employers. Now pensions uh, came over from Denmark because Denmark is on auto rom, so they came over here. I believe they tried to get the Nest job and didn't get it, so therefore they then set up in competition, which I quite admire. Um, but they're also charging, and, and they, 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 they haven't built their own software, so they have quite a lot of uh, cost, uh, I would say. I, wouldn't, I can't speak for them, of course, but um, that's them. Incumbents, so Legal and General, Aviva, Standard Life, all these big organizations that have been around forever, they struggle at the lower end of the market, right? So they have not got slick, clean, frictionless experiences. So those guys typically will charge upfront fees. Um, and then nimble people coming into the market, it's too late. The regulatory framework is changing. They won't get it. There's only a year to go. They won't. There's this. Too, so there's no one else who's going to come in, at least in this uh, land grab phase. Um, so with regards to our competitors, I think I've, I've, we're the only ones um, who have built our technology from the ground up, um, and that gives us massive advantages in terms of our cost of customer services. So we have nine people in our office in Pool, supporting uh, 30,000 companies and nearly 200,000 employees currently. We know that our, all of our competitors have hundreds of support staff for fewer. Uh, companies. We have more employers on our books than anyone apart from the government now, despite arriving three years late. Um, so that gives us a massive advantage in terms of our staffing costs, and it also gives us a massive advantage in terms of the technology costs. We don't pay this guy 50p a month per member and this guy 50p a month per member. We pay pe fractions of pennies. So that means that we can take on a one-person employer or 10,000 people. It doesn't matter to us because the cost of the IT and support is, is, is is tiny. We initially were quite tactical and just do this thing and then you know, we'll maybe we'll sell to someone and we'll be gone because it's just we'll do, the, we'll do the hard work and then someone will pick the platform up. But I think that as we've gone through it and we've got more substantial and, and take more and more share and, and actually feel that we're getting ahead of we're pulling away from our competitors as opposed to them catching us up. We think there's an opportunity to do something pretty special. So you know, within the UK we've got a really interesting position in the core primary market where it's people are, new people are setting up pensions. We think there's a really big opportunity in the secondary market around existing books of business and around the consolidation through regulatory change. We think there's a lot of stuff we can do around taking people on journeys with us with regarding other products. So that's really interesting and you know, uh, intellectually stimulating. And then I think there's a real opportunity on the international front now. We, most global economies are facing the same challenge and will probably come to the same solution. And we think that we are probably relatively uniquely positioned to help with that. So the government, Nest, here, they're not going to go international. That's not what they do. They're the government. Um, our competitors are generally British-based and not thinking about this, and they haven't got the platform that can be used to do international. So the vision is that we nail, in this, the short-term tactical thing is just complete, continue to focus on our business as usual um, and do a really good job of that in our core UK market. Well, we wish you every success with uh, your business, and thank, thank you very you. much for your time today. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Shortlisted Productions specialise in the production of business video content for corporate clients. Please contact us for a free quote at shortlistedproductions.com.